<clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the California Immunization Coalition Education Hour. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you need technical assistance, please use the chat box in the bottom right of your screen. A link has also been sent out in the chat box to all participants that can help troubleshoot any technical issues. During the webinar, you're welcome to ask questions, and you can do so by typing them into the question box or chat box in the lower right of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time, remaining questions will be answered over email. Now introducing your host and moderator, Meg Dorsey. Greetings everyone and welcome. I am Meg Dorsey, a CIC board member and chairperson for the CIC Education Committee and I'll be your moderator for today's call. The California Immunization Coalition hosts education hours throughout the year on immunization related topics to help our colleagues stay up to date on important news and information. Today, we have a very exciting and timely program for you, which is titled Vaccine Mandates and COVID-19, which we hope you will find valuable and informative in today's world of ongoing pandemics with its twists and turns in disease incidents and changing guidance as the pandemic evolves. This program will be especially useful for public health professionals, business owners, employers, and human resource departments, among many others. Following today's webinar, a recording of the webinar will be available to you on the CIC YouTube channel, which you can access via the immunize.org website. If you are unfamiliar with this new feature on the CIC website, I encourage you all to check it out. Also be aware that there are many previously recorded education hours that may be of interest to you. I am now pleased to introduce our featured speaker today, Professor Dorit Rice. Professor Rice teaches torts, administrative law, and public health law at the University of California Hastings College of Law. Her work focuses on healthcare and social policies. Increasingly, her research and activities have focused on legal issues related to vaccines, including exemption laws and tort liability related to non-vaccination. She has published law review and peer review articles and many blog posts on, on legal issues related to vaccines. She's a member of the Parents Advisory Board of Voices for Vaccines and active in advocacy uh, uh, throughout, throughout the state. She is a member of the Vaccine Working Group on Ethics and Policy, and she is a past recipient of the California Immunization Coalition Champion Award. Professor Rice received her undergraduate law degree, uh, undergraduate degree in law and political science in 1999 from the Faculty of Law and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She received her PhD in the, uh, uh, from the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program at UC Berkeley. In addition to being a tireless advocate for public health and immunizations, she's also a frequent contributor to journals, blogs, and news media. She is a very popular and often requested speaker at conferences and in legislative hearings. The objective for today's call is to become familiar with the social, historical, and legal background for vaccine mandates. I'm sure this, everyone will find this very interesting. And now we welcome Professor Rice to begin her presentation. Dorit, the mic is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be back with the dedicated audience of the CIC and to see all of you. Um, I'm going to talk today about vaccine mandate and most of the talk will be about employer mandates, but I am adding in at the end, um, a little bit about state mandate because some of what we're seeing as state mandate. Let me just close the window because the bird is not considering our presentation. Uh, here's my conflict of interest uh, statement. I don't think GSK is a vaccine candidate for COVID is anywhere near ready to go out, but just in case. So I want to say something about where we are. Then I want to spend the bulk of the talk talking about employer mandates. Then I want to talk about state mandates uh, mostly, 
And I want to end by a comment about other states facing laws that limit mandates, because although we're in California, what happens in other states is going to impact us. So I want to start by reminding you that we're probably not where we hoped we'd be in August 2021. Uh, once again, COVID-19 has thrown us a curveball. We hoped, I think most of us hoped that with the vaccines, uh, we'll have a pandemic mostly under control, but the new Delta variant is changing the game of us, on us again. Um, since this is probably going to come up, I will say that my discussion of mandates uh, isn't removed or undermined by the fact that the Delta variant may be less effective, at, that the vaccine may be less effective at preventing transmission from the Delta variant, as long as the vaccines at least reduce transmission. So as you've seen, where we are is that looking to stop the, the spread of COVID under the Delta variant, many are reaching for vaccine mandates. We're seeing several states that put in place requirements for mandates. Our own California has, is now requiring them for healthcare workers and teachers and looking for elsewhere. We're seeing employers that are individually choosing to mandate the vaccines. And the legal question is, can they do that? I will add going in that uh, the, what I, I'm focusing on the can you do that? Whether you should involves other things, including what kind of workforce you have. Have you solved the access problem? Because mandating before you have access to vaccine is an issue. Uh, so remember, this is can you do that more than should you do that? Another starting point is that vaccine mandates are not new. We have a long history of vaccine mandates going back to the 19th century. Uh, all states and the District of Columbia require vaccine for elementary school, but university vaccine mandates go back to the 19th century. Employer mandates are at least several decades old and state mandates also have a long history. Is something different now? Well, a few things and we'll get to that. Let me start by narrowing in even more in the workplace. And again, we've seen vaccine mandates in the workplace. We haven't seen them in the scope we're talking about now, but the CDC has been recommending, for example, vaccines for healthcare personnel for a while. And we've seen healthcare personnel require a vaccine at least since the 1990s, probably before that, but at least in the 1990s. Can they do that? The short answer is yes, but. A, Making the workplace safe is not only a right of the employer, it's also an obligation. And employers have a moral ethical obligation to make the workplace safe. And they also have an economic incentive in keeping the workplace safe of disease. So imposing a vaccine mandate, which, which is generally a health and safety rule, is legal, but there are limits. In this case, there's at least one issue that raises a general question. Can you require vac these vaccines? And there are other uh, laws that can limit the ability of specific employers or require exemptions. Uh, and as you can see, I'm going to talk generally about EUAs, Civil Rights Act of 1964, ADA, and I'll go back to privacy and what are your requirements in terms of privacy later, collective bargaining agreements, and at the end, after I finish the other part of the presentation, I'll go back to different laws of individual states, not California. So the big question for COVID-19 vaccines is, these vaccines are not yet FDA approved. They may become FDA approved shortly, but we can't know exactly when they were. And since the beginning, an open question was, can you require a vaccine under an EUA? This is a new question because we've never had a vaccine authorized under an EUA for the entire population before. Uh, so the question of how far can you mandate hasn't come up. And there's some provisions in the EUA law that uh, go the other way. Specifically, the EUA law has a provision that under the heading required condition requires the secretary to establish condition, including the following letting recipients know of the option to refuse a, or accept administration of the product, of the consequences of refusing administration and of alternatives. So some very respectable people look at this provision and say, this means no mandates. And although you might hear otherwise, this is still a legally open question. There are increasing indications that yes, you can mandate a vaccine under any way, but it's still a legally open question. 
on one side, opponents of man say, since the law says that recipients have the option to accept or refuse a, man, a, a vaccine, you can't mandate it. They also say that because this is federal law, it trumps over state or private employers' action. And before COVID-19 vaccine, FDA and CDC officials have said multiple times that no, you can't mandate an EUA vaccine. The opponents also say because the vaccine are still not licensed, they're experimental and they, you cannot ethically mandate. On the other side, supporters, people who think you can uh, mandate a vaccine under an EUA say, the law mentions that there could be consequences to refusal. The law does not mention private employers, universities, by the way, or states at all. And we know that we have a history of all of these actors requiring vaccines before. And the CDC has revised its statement after the pandemic and, and allows and says that the question of mandate is a state and local government question. And finally, for the more ethical argument that vac the vaccine is experimental, we can push back and say these vaccines weren't through clinical trials in tens of thousands of people. We're given to over 150 million. Calling them effective, uh, experimental is really stretching the meaning of the world. In fact, maybe twisting it. At least two legal developments make this question uh, more tilted towards the people who think mandates are allowed. First of all, in the only court decision on this so far, a federal district court in Texas, uh, the judge found that the employer, Houston Methodist Hospital, could mandate the vaccine for the employees. And second, the Office of Legal Counsel, the president's lawyers, the president's advisors, came out with a very reasoned memo that says, yes, you can mandate an EUA vaccine. The law doesn't really limit it. Notice that neither of these are binding in court. Neither of these are going to determine how a court would rule, but both are persuasive. Both are going to influence the views of a court. So the first question is, can you mind it in a vaccine under an EUA? It's still an open question, but there are legal indications that you're that although you're taking a legal risk if you mandate the vaccine under an EUA, it's not a huge risk. If we're lucky, in the next few weeks, maybe the vaccine will be licensed and this will become a moot issue, but it's still not a moot issue now. Another potential limit on employers who seek to mandate is that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in Title VII that refers to employers says that employers with 15 or more employees can discriminate because of religion. For the workplace, this has been interpreted to mean that an employer that has an employee with a sincere religious objection to a workplace rule, not just vaccines, but also vaccines, needs to provide that employee a reasonable accommodation unless it's an undue burden. Obviously, there are several moving parts here, and I'll take them one at a time. The first question is, what's a sincere religious objection? Uh, we know, at least I hope you, you'll agree with me, that most people who don't vaccinate aren't acting of religion. They're acting because they were afraid of, a, of vaccine or because they've been convinced that vaccines are not a good idea. Being afraid of the vaccine is not a religious belief. But the question, given that, how, how far does a religious belief Go. And the jurisprudence sets a, basically a three part test for this. To be a sincere religious belief, it has to, the belief has to address fundamental and ultimate questions. So, are vaccines safe is not one of those fundamental and ultimate questions. It has to be something big, uh, something deep. Your belief has to be about as part of a comprehensive belief system not just grabbing onto one Bible verse to show that, you, um, that your body is your temple and you, therefore you can't take the vaccine. It has to be part of something bigger. And normally, but not always, a religion would have formal and external signs like rites or a physical appearance. It's not required, but it could support your claim that this is a sincere religious belief. A big problem here is that policing what is and isn't a religious exemption is really, really hard, really tricky. The, the, the heart of the issue is that the test is the personal belief of the believer. You, it's not does the believer belong to an organized religion that opposes vaccine. So you can't limit it to people who can bring you a letter from the clergy. Uh, because 
that discriminates against people who have a personal belief opposing the rule, but are not part of an organized religion. You can't say if your religion, you, the Catholic, the Jew, whatever the religion supports vaccine, we won't accept your exemption because it's not about the organized religion. It's about the personal belief. A Catholic or a Jew can disagree with the official religious position of the religious leaders. And that's okay. Again, this is sincerity. You can't say what you're saying is irrational. I don't be, it doesn't make sense. And therefore you can't have a religious exemption. You're looking at sincerity. It doesn't have to be rational. I use the example, and I know this is an extreme and an illogical example, that if the person is a believer of the invisible pink unicorn and believes that their skin can only be intentionally pierced by the horn of the invisible pink unicorn, that's a sincere religious belief for this purpose. But you can't require the person to explain out and set out their belief in a letter. Uh, and if there's any indication that there is a sincerity problem, you can look into it, but be aware that this is an area where there's a lot of pitfalls. So first, showing sincerity is hard. Second, let's assume you have someone that you conclude that has a sincere religious belief against vaccine. What do you need to do? So if, unless it's an undue burden, I'll talk about that in the next slide, you have to give reasonable accommodation. And what the courts are looking for when they look at reasonable accommodation is a, a good faith effort to provide an alternative that allows the religious person to work, uh, but you can take steps to reduce the risk. Uh, I'll give one example. I won't give the second example I have here, but this is a case from the influenza vaccine. Robinson refused an influenza vaccine when her work mandated it, saying that uh, as a Muslim, she won't ac accept a pork, a pork gelatin, a vaccine containing pork gelatin. Her employer offered her a different vaccine that did not con con uh, contain pork gelatin. She refused that as well, citing another religious provision. Uh, her employer said, we can't let you work with patients under these conditions, but we, uh, will, we will help you try and find an alternative job. And they actually helped her find an interview to another non-patient uh, facing job in the workplace. Uh, but she didn't get that job. So they tried to help her find another. Nothing was found. They offered her two weeks leave to keep trying. And then they uh, registered her uh, termination as resignation, which would allow her to apply to a job again. So they did several things to try and work with her. It didn't work out. They ended up terminating her, but her case was rejected. Uh, so that's one example. Actually, I will give the other one. The other one, in the other case, in Bay State, uh, an employee who was not patient facing, was her job was to be a receptionist and under the phone. And she was given a religious exemption, but required to wear a mask. And uh, what happened was that she was penalized for taking the mask down while she was alone in a room talking on the phone, saying that the mask interfered with her, her, um, her phone use. So she was terminated over that. And the court was saying, this doesn't look like any effort to accommodate her. So that raises the question, can you offer the people with sincere religious objection at testing and masking accommodation? And the answer is probably, as long as you go about it reasonably, you probably are going to run into issues if you require them to mask in a closed private uh, office, unless you have a really good reason to do that. Uh, but otherwise, you can probably require testing and masking. We've seen testing and masking used during the pandemic, and that's a reasonable alternative. When do you not have to give this? So the standard is undue burden, which means no more than minimal costs. And several very well-respected scholars are saying this means you don't have to give a religious accommodation at all under condition of COVID-19. And I actually think there's a lot to that. Risk of COVID-19 may be more than minimal costs. But I will say that if you're giving a, an exemption to people with medical conditions or medical contraindication against vaccination, and you already have a testing and masking program in place, uh, first of all, you might have reasons to want to give uh, it to people with religious exemption, it, either to reduce litigation or because it's a way to overcome some of the privacy issues that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, or uh, it might be, not be considered uh, reasonable to refuse this to others. So that's about religion. 
Let's talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. By the way, I see that there's a lot in the chat. I can't look at the chat right now. I hope one of my moderators will give me a signal if there's anything that really can't wait and I should um, address because I really can't look right now when I'm talking. So the American with Disabilities Act, and here you can see a picture of President Bush Sr., uh, Bush 41, signing it, um, uh, basically prevent discrimination against people with disabilities. It requires employers to accommodate people with disabilities unless it's an undue burden. And you'll see in a moment that undue burden here has a very different meaning. Uh, I won't talk about what disability means, but it almost certainly, I think certainly, includes having a real medical contraindication to the vaccine. One exception for this uh, requirement is if someone is a direct threat. So if someone really is an immediate threat to a vulnerable population, uh, that's not very well defined, but employers that have, for example, very vulnerable population can probably make a case that uh, having an unvaccinated employee may be too high a risk, a direct threat. Uh, I will point out that the, the few people with real medical reason not to be vaccinated aren't the villains here. Uh, there are people who can't be protected, and for policy reasons as well, if, you just, if this can be limited to just the people who really cannot be vaccinated, it's probably the right thing to do to give them the accommodation. Again, you can add, as we said before, you can add testing or masking as your accommodation. Undue burden here is a high uh, bar. It requires showing significant burden. And you would be considering factors like the cost of the accommodation, and that would uh, include what are your resources to help offset it, uh, the facility size and number of employees, what kind of operations are we talking about? Uh, the risk is not the same for a long-term care facility and a, a, and a store where people don't stay for very long. Um, and the impact of an accommodation on other things. So the American Disabilities Act uh, requires an accommodation if someone has a real medical contraindication, unless it meets this high bar or you can show direct threat. The third limit I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about it very shortly, is collective bargaining. Not because it's a weak limit, it's a strong limit, but because there's not a lot to say. And then I'll talk about privacy in the workplace. So there are limits on mandating vaccines from collective bargaining. This applies if you have a unionized workforce, so it won't apply to all employers. And it would apply if the specific collective bargaining for that workplace requires negotiating with the union before mandating. So it's really going to be a very case, by case basis, but there are cases in which employers were um, required to um, uh, negotiate with the union before mandating. Let's talk about privacy for a moment. In California, and I think in most states, employers have protection, employees have protection for medical uh, information given to the employee, employer. But it's not from where you often hear. First of all, for most employers, it's not from HIPAA. Uh, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and it protects you from having your medical provider disclose your medical information. It does not protect an employer that is not your medical provider from asking you for vaccine status. Even if your employer is your medical provider, it won't protect HR from asking you to give your vaccine status. It, it won't protect you from HR asking you for your vaccine status. Um, it, not HIPAA, but elsewhere, your, in, any information you give the employer would be protected from disclosure generally. But HIPAA is not relevant here. HIPAA is this imaginary thing that some people have come up with to justify not giving the vaccine status to anyone. It's not a real thing. You can see that in the bottom where it says, is it real? HIPAA is not a real thing, the HIPPA. There are other sources of protection of privacy of your information given to the employer. The American with Disabilities Act protects your privacy to some degree if you're disabled. The uh, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, which is the agency in, in charge of interpreting and applying the ADA in the workplace, makes it clear that just asking for vaccination status is not a disability-related inquiry that triggers the American with Disabilities Act. 
However, if you're imposing a general vaccine mandate, but giving exceptions, medical exception to people with medical contraindication, asking for that information is a disability related inquiry because you're asking for information that they qualify because they have a disability, a medical reason not to vaccinate. Doing it is, first of all, allowed. You can say, I'm going to accommodate people with disabilities under the American Disabilities Act, but you have to show me your disability. However, you need to protect the privacy of those people. And I'll get to what does mean in practice in a moment. So you can ask for a, evidence of a disability under the American Disabilities Act, but you're going to have to be careful on how you handle the information you get from it. Uh, I think that you can see the top because there's a bar going. So the top of here is the California Confidentiality of Medical Information Act. And I'll have a link to that act at the bottom. I think the slides will be made available later. I can put the uh, link in the chat if not. Um, so this act protects the confidentiality of any medical information employees give to the employer, among other things, but it's okay under it for the employer to ask for information for a medical exception. The employer would have to protect that information and keep pre pre preserve the employee's privacy. This raises a question that comes up often. If I have to protect the privacy of people who is a medical exception, am I allowed to require a mask? Um, because wearing a mask is kind of a disclosure. Uh, the short answer is probably. As with law, there's very, very rarely a certainty, but some things are certain. If you're giving another exception, such as religion, you can, you can I, I think definitely, but I probably should, be, should qualify by it, but I won't. I think you can require a mask because if there, there's more than one kind of exception, the person wearing a mask isn't disclosing a, a medical condition. There might be other reasons for them being exempt and wearing a mask. Likely, if it's only a medical exemption. Now, this isn't directly relevant right now because right now I, I think everybody's supposed to mask inside. Um, so if everybody's masking, of course you can require a mask. You're not disclosing anything. But if you get to a point where most people can remove masks and you're keeping the mask for the unvaccinated, if, as long as there's reason to say uh, people may wear a mask for a variety of reasons, you're not actually disclosing the person medical information. And even if it's not the case, you can probably make a case that this is an important accommodation and an important tool to prevent infection. Here is the link to the uh, provision of the law. Now I'm going to pivot a little in my last uh, eight or, or, or so minutes uh, and talk about state mandates, because we know that some of the mandates in California come from the state. And when it's a state, we're in somewhat different territory. Uh, when the state is acting as an employer, the state is subject to, to two badly distinguished systems of regulation. One is an employer and the other is a state subject to constitutional requirement. When the state is acting as a state, as the governing authority, for example, telling healthcare facilities they have to um, a require vaccine or a city telling bars and restaurants to require vaccine, not to mention any cities, uh, other requirements apply. Generally speaking, states have the plenary authority to regulate in the public health, but there are limits to that. So this goes back to 1905 and the famous case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts, which upheld the vaccine mandate on the ground that yes, you have the power to limit individual rights in the public health. But, said Jacobson, you can do that if it's reasonable. In the circumstances in Jacobson, where there was an, a smallpox outbreak uh, and the state required people to vaccinate to stop it, that was seen, the city required people to vaccinate to stop it, that was seen as highly reasonable. Um, but it's not unlimited. We know that states and uh, cities can require vaccine even when there isn't an ongoing outbreak to prevent them, but that's not as big an issue during COVID-19. So the, the main point here is states do have the power to regulate in the public health, but at the very least, that regulation needs to meet a bar of reasonableness. And we know that states have been allowed to require vaccines for school, 
but we also know that it's been a while since we've seen adult vaccine mandates. The most recent experience, and that has been a limited one, was in New York in 2019, where New York City required that uh, residents in three neighborhoods where there were high levels of measles outbreak vaccinate or pay a fine of $1,000. That was upheld in the only court that looked at it, but it's still, uh, we need to keep in mind that it's an issue. I will say that from the state's point of view, to survive legal scrutiny, a narrower mandate is more likely to survive than a, a broader one. I will also mention that the questions I raised about the emergency use authorization applies to state as much as to employers. The last part of the state picture is, what about religious freedom? If the state is requiring a vaccine, does it have to offer religious exemption? And the short answer is it's complicated. The First Amendment protects people's free exercise. Jacobson in 1905 that upheld the vaccine mandate was not subject to the First Amendment because at the time in 1905, the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights generally was not yet applied to the states. Um, the uh, Bill of Rights was a uh, was uh, applied to the states first in 1940 in Cantwell versus Connecticut. Since then, there's a, uh, let me go back. Since then, there's a question that what does that mean for a general public health law or a rule like a vaccine mandate? Do you have to give a religious exemption? The most recent word from the Supreme Court on that is in 1991 in Employment Division versus Smith, the court said, if you're imposing a generally applicable rule, neutral on its face, isn't targeting religion, you don't have to give a religious exemption. There's always been an exception to that from 1993 in the Church of Lokumi Babalu, which said that if you're targeting religion, you do need to be more careful and meet strict scrutiny, but the vaccine mandates we're talking about are general, so they don't qualify here. But since at least 2020, the Supreme Court has been moving to tighten protection of religious freedom. Uh, this started with the case of a Roman Catholic diocese against Cuomo, in which the Supreme Court said that you can't impose more strict requirement on churches than on other equivalent uh, facilities uh, under public health rubric, <coughs> and it's continued things. The most recent word we have from the Supreme Court on this is Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. It's not about vaccines, it's not about public health, but that's the most recent work, case in which the Supreme Court looked at religious freedom. And after Fulton, we're still not clear where we are. The Fulton case did not have a majority to overturn the Smith rule, did not have a majority to say, we're throwing out the rule that for a, religious, for a generally applicable rule, you don't have to give a religious exemption. So we don't have a majority yet. We know that the exception that if you show hostility to religion, you, you have to meet a higher bar still stands, but we're not sure what this means if uh, otherwise. Fulton said, if you have a generally applicable exception that allows you to give anyone an exception, you have to also give an exception to religious objections. But it's not clear. If you have any secular exceptions, do you have to also give a religious exemption? And this is important because vaccine mandates always have a medical exemption and rightly so. People who cannot safely be vaccinated shouldn't be. So we are in an area of uncertainty whether the Supreme Court at some point will require religious exemption for vaccine mandates. I know this was kind of a lot together, but the bottom line is at this point, we're not sure whether if a state requires vaccine without giving a religious exemption, the Supreme Court will allow that. I will add, and this is really a sidebar because it's not applicable to California, that in some states, there are religious freedom restoration act that require any law that burdens religion to meet a higher bar, the bar of strict scrutiny, which requires showing that the requirement is for a compelling interest and is the least restrictive means for that. California doesn't have one. So the real question for us is, will the Supreme Court require a religious exemption for a state mandate? The last part I want to talk about is uh, the fact that some states have limited vaccine 
requirements. Uh, and we've seen states limit this, and they use the language of vaccine passport, either through governor executive orders or through statutes. The vast majority of these uh, limits the ability to require vaccines or to require vaccine documentation to government agency. So uh, they're saying government units can't require vaccines. This would, for example, prevent a local government from imposing a vaccine mandate, but it doesn't apply to private businesses. A minority of these also apply to private businesses. Here are some examples. Montana's law is probably the broadest. Montana is saying it's unlawful to a person or a government to refuse services based on a person's vaccination status or whether they have an immunity passport. So that doesn't allow private businesses to require vaccines from patrons. Um, we, North Dakota has a similar uh, law. A private business located in the state cannot require a patron or customer to provide any documentation certifying vaccination or post-transmission post recovery. Similarly, Iowa has a, a limit from requiring customers or patrons to show vaccines. For employers, a lot less states have moved, but there are a few. And I'm going to go back to Montana for this last slide and say that in Montana, it is unlawful for an employer to refuse employment or discriminate in any other way. And that probably should be interpreted to uh, prohibit employers from requiring higher testing or masking requirements from employees based on the person's vaccination status. So that's happening in other states. That's going to be relevant for us uh, if we have businesses that cross states, such as a uh, public transit that goes across state line, or if we have people coming in from other states that may have different requirements. And that's what I want to say now. I will now step back and pass the baton back to Catherine and let you, and I'm ready for your questions. Please don't hesitate to ask um, any questions or, uh, or provide any feedback. Oh, you're on mute, may I make? Mute, uh, Meg, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. So thank you so much, Professor Rice, for a fascinating and important talk. For those of us who work to support full vaccination for children and adults, I have a feeling that your uh, comments have generated uh, a lot. Of, they've answered a lot of questions and they've generated a lot of questions. So we've received many already in the um, in the Q and A section and in the chat. So. For our listeners, if you've been waiting patiently to ask a question, now is the time. Please type your question. If you've already typed it, we've got them in queue. But please type your question in the question section or the chat. That'll work too at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, we will get to them. As Kemmer mentioned at the beginning, uh, we will get to as many questions as we can. And those that we're unable to address, we will uh, reply via email. And while we give everyone a moment to type in questions, a couple of reminders. I would like to remind you all that following the program, an evaluation will automatically pop up on your screen. We truly appreciate your responses. The California Immunization Coalition produces at least three to four education hours per year, and we rely on your feedback for preparing and improving these calls. But before we move on to our questions, I would like to introduce Catherine Martin, my dear friend and the Executive Director of the California Immunization Coalition, to make a few comments that I'm sure you'll find very interesting. Catherine? Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much, Dorit, as always. Um, I wanna take just a few minutes to remind everybody about the availability of a digital vaccination record that can be accessed. Go ahead, next slide, Cameron. Um, via the via myvaccinerecord.cdph.ca.gov. Um, if you got your COVID vaccination in California, you should be able to download a digital record with a QR code that can be read by a smart health card reader app. Um, I, I knew this technology was in the works and everything, but I tried it out myself. It all works brilliantly. I know some people have had a challenge with um, getting an accurate record um, of their vaccinations, but that's been the exception. And I just want to encourage you to make sure that you have downloaded this vaccination record and to share this with your clients, your patients, um, your customers, um, that this is available. Um, so next slide, please. Here are the really basic steps, and I'm not going to read them to you, but you can read while I'm talking. Mm -hmm. It took me just minutes to enter the very basic information and download this to my phone. Um, 
super simple, took me more time to probably type all this stuff in this morning. <laughs> um, exceptions to this, however, are if you your vaccinations came from a federal agency, for example, the Department of Defense, um, Veterans Affairs, Indian Health Services, it may not be in the system, but give it a try. And one way or the other, you'll be able to access this digitally. Um, so you can use it if you need to. So next slide, please. For those organizations or employers who are checking for vaccination status, who want to ensure that their, their students, their employees, their patrons um, are vaccinated, there is also a free smart health cart verifier that was created by a partnership through the Commons Project. And again, as Meg has said a couple times, this presentation will be on our YouTube channel, so you can check this out later. Happy to give you the link separately if you, um, or, or you can Google them. Um, but this app can be downloaded via the App Store or on Google Play. And uh, it's a free scanner tool that can let you know whether the smart health card is valid and provide key information. It just provides the name, the vaccination received, the brand, mm -hmm. um, the date, and the place you received it. On my record, because I tried that myself to make sure this all worked, um, it did not show my birth date. I understand it could maybe, it, it may just depend on who gave the vaccination. I don't know, but on my, when it read my, my smart health card, it did not show my birth date. So very minimal information that, that is needed to be able to show Vera. And so then you know it's a valid card. Um, so we're not gonna answer specific questions on these apps today because there's very much better <laughs> FAQs on both of these sites, but we simply wanna make you aware of this resource that can really help make the process easy and accessible for the community and for businesses or other entities that want to verify vaccination status. And thank you again, Meg, for uh, letting me have a few minutes of time from today's presentation. And I'll hand it back to you to answer questions. And if you need any help with that, technically I'll be happy to help too. Great. Well, I'm smiling from ear to ear because we have tons of great questions and we actually have some time to address them. So um, let's go right ahead to back to Professor Rice. I'm gonna try to group some of these together. We're getting many questions in both the chat and the question section. So, so your question may be kind of rolled into another question. So a lot of the questions are having to do with accountability for those that are unvaccinated. So this is one that I'm gonna roll a few together. Do you anticipate lawsuits against unvaccinated persons when they create a burden and they transmit COVID to vulnerable patients such as immunocompromised or children or the, or the vaccinated who, who simply had breakthrough disease? Um, and also how about accountability such as paying for your health care, or possibly paying for ongoing testing if you refuse to be vaccinated? Just want to um, start you off with an easy one. Uh, yes. So um, let me, let, um, my video is on, by the way. I don't know why you're not seeing me and I apologize for that. It's, it looks like it's been on the whole time and I'm not sure why it's um, not showing me. Now we can see you. Gotcha. Okay. Whew. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, so starting from the top, there may be a possibility of lawsuits against people who uh, in, infect uh, uh, others. It's not going to be an easy lawsuit, lawsuit for a number of uh, reasons. Uh, there may also be potential lawsuits against workplaces that don't take uh, precautions to protect, for example, customers, uh, as, as long as there isn't um, a, a state law barring such lawsuits. Neither of those are going to be very easy and I'll just mention two problems that may come up. One is that normally uh, there's no duty, no legal duty to act in the benefit of others. And some will say not vaccinating is not acting. And so um, that, that may be one barrier. The other barrier is it won't always be easy to show causation, to show that the unvaccinated person is actually the one who infected you, especially since COVID can transform in, an, in a in a pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic way. That said, it's not impossible, especially in the right kind of case. If I had to bet, I'd bet that if we see lawsuits, there'll be, for example, against staff of nursing uh, home facilities or even and nursing home facilities in states where there is not a mandate, uh, when a vulnerable person was infected and that can be traced to an unvaccinated staff member. Um, but I think we may see uh, some lawsuits. As to um, 
consequences for health insurance, that's a lot trickier. The Affordable Care Act makes it hard to, to um, require people to pay for a uh, harm that was at least part of fault. And not necessarily, and, and that's not unusual. Remember, we don't force people who got uh, cancer from uh, smoking to pay for their health costs. So we tend not to use health insurance to penalize people for this. Uh, there are ways to impose some consequences. For example, we can say, we'll give the vaccinated a health, a health premium discount for vaccinating uh, rather than um, uh, penalizing the people who aren't vaccinated. Thank you. All right, so our next question is regarding privacy. And I know you made a few very interesting comments on this subject at the beginning of your talk. Oh, so question regarding privacy and mandates. Um, do you have any comments on requiring employer employees, an employer to require an employee to have something like a sticker or an indicator, like a badge uh, or a button to identify them as vaccinated? Um, so the, the issue there would be, does, the, does that uh, violate any of the uh, medical information privacy rules? And um, it, it may. So on one hand, vac being vaccinated is privacy rules, uh, and you may be violating that, but we know that this has been used before and that um, it uh, hasn't been struck down by a court, to my knowledge. So we probably can. And I think part of the rationale for allowing this uh, in the past is that um, showing that you're vaccinated doesn't necessarily uh, say more than um, whether you're vaccinated or not. So for example, it doesn't say uh, whether you're unvaccinated because of a medical reason, because of a religious reason, or just because you don't want to be. Plus, if we're talking about a mask, there might be other reasons to wear a mask besides, uh, uh, be, besides being unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, <clears throat> we have quite a list here. So thank you so much for your additional comments. Um, you made a you clarified uh, the difference between mandating a vaccine under full FDA approval versus emergency youth authorization, and it was a little fuzzy. Do you mm -hmm. anticipate school requirements once we have full FDA approval? So, how, and, and what steps would have to be taken once we have full FDA Good. approval? Do you believe we will move to, to mandates, and if so, what steps would need to be taken? So generally for uh, school mandates, uh, school mandates in California are handled under state law. I expect that the district that tries to go on it alone might run into claims of preemption by the state law, that the state law already covers this enough. So the probably the, the what we'll need to see is state action. Uh, our state currently offers two paths to such action. One is the legislative path. The legislature passes COVID-19, add, adds COVID-19 to the a required vaccine, and that would be under the condition that the legislature sets. Uh, the other is the Department of Health can add vaccines to the schedule. And I'll say two comments about that. A, the Department of Health has never done that. And I would be surprised if they'd want to do it with COVID-19, where there's going to be very strong feelings in some areas for a mandate and very strong feeling against the mandate in other areas. It's a, it's probably a political minefield that a bureaucratic uh, department would maybe rightly want to leave to the legislature, but I'm not sure. The Department of Public Health has, has been very active in pandemic country, counting, so they might. Second, if the Department of Health adds the vaccine rather than the legislature, there is a personal belief exemption that attaches to the mandate. So if it's not by the legislature, it, the, a mandate will have a personal belief exemption. Thank you. So another question came in uh, in many different fashions. So essentially, would you please clarify for us for whom the COVID vaccine is mandated in California? For example, healthcare workers and teachers, are they currently mandated? And what is the circumstance and some of the issues about that? So I'm nervous because uh, Right, these things are moving so fast and I don't know if anything new happened today. As far as I know, California currently mandates uh, healthcare workers to be vaccinated. And my reading of that specific order is that it's a, a mandate or terminate. So not a, a, so for state employees, the mandate is a vaccinate or a vaccinate or test. 
my reading of the order for healthcare workers and others might read it differently is that it's a, a vaccinate or, or, or be terminated unless you have a, a medical or religious exemption. The state is offering both medical and religious exemptions. Uh, and uh, the teacher's order, I haven't looked at it as thoroughly, but I think it's also a, a vaccine. I think it's a vaccinated or test like the uh, uh, other state employees. Uh, so, as far as I know, California is currently mandating vaccines for state employees, healthcare workers, and teachers. But for both state employees and, and teachers, it's a vaccinate or test mandate, what I'd call a soft mandate. You don't get you you you're not fired if you if you if you don't vaccinate. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, um, for healthcare workers, it's it's vaccinate or terminate. And for teachers, it's vaccinate or test. That's my reading. And that's my reading of the healthcare worker order. Uh, the healthcare worker order does not expressly say it that way, but it says that the only people who can test instead of vaccination are the people who have medical or a uh, religious exemption. So my reading is that those that don't can't, can't test as an alternative. So this, this may seem a little retro as we moved along with California law and school mandates and so forth. You, you've spoken to religious exemptions and outlined that very clearly. Um, could you make a, a comment about personal beliefs exemptions, which we don't have anymore, but maybe comment on what's the difference between a personal yes. belief and a religious, and then of course a medical exemption. Good, to be a religious exemption, an exemption, um, an exemption has to be about religion, which means it needs to me meet the three parts test I mentioned earlier in my slides. Uh, it has to be about fundamental questions. It has to be part of a comprehensive system of belief and it helps, but it's not required um, if there are external signs like rights or clothing, it's not required. This, where it came up for questions is for example, is being a vegan a religious reason against vaccinating? And the courts have been split on that. Some of them have said this is part of a comprehensive world belief about fundamental questions. So yes, being vegan qualifies you for religious belief and others have said no. Um, so um, we know that just having fears about the vaccines is not a religious argument. A personal belief exemption will allow you to refuse the vaccine practically for any reason. It doesn't have to meet specific requirements. Ooh, there's so many questions coming in on this that are so complex, and I know that this is all so new. So, of course, you know, we don't have case law, and this is all going to be tested in the court. Mm -hmm. But, um, for example, um, if a healthcare worker refuses to be vaccinated and doesn't have a medical or religious exemption that's valid, would they be considered a voluntary reg resignation and Good. not be eligible for unemployment? Good. So, um a recurring question is, does uh, some, uh, if someone does not have uh, an exemption and refuses to vaccinate and are terminated over that, do they qualify for uh, unemployment? Um, generally speaking, so first of all, a worker can resign over this. Anti-vaccine people are telling them not to resign because if they don't resign, they'll be eligible, eligible for unemployment when they're fired. But generally speaking, being fired because you refuse, refuse to comply with the work rule is being fired for cause. And I'm saying this with some hesitation because I'm not an employment expert, but that's my understanding. Uh, if you're fired for cause, you're not eligible for unemployment uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. So um, refusing a, a vaccination may end up bearing someone's eligibility for uh, unemployment. I'm a little hesitant about that, and I'd, I'd probably want to double check this with an uh, employment law expert, and I will, and I, I hear differently. I'll send you an answer, and I hope you can get it to participants, uh, right. but, but that's my best answer. And again, uh, kind of in the weeds on this issue, but um, uh, an understanding from one of our questions is that, um, that uh, permanent employees have to be vaccinated, healthcare workers vaccinated or terminated. Uh, what if you're a temporary employee or what if you're a remote employee? I've looked at the uh, executive order, but I admit I don't remember it to that level of detail. Uh, you'd have to see the exact wording of the order. 
Can I say something about another thing, question that I saw incoming, um, uh, in coming, uh, that, that I saw coming through and that is another recurring issue? Um, a recurring issue that comes up is, um, thank you. Um, a recurring issue that comes up is, um, here we go. Uh, do, who has to pay for the testing? And I think that's an area of legal and clarity as well. In most places that I've seen, the employers have been providing testing, but I think it's legitimate for the employer to say, you have to submit the test and I don't have to pay for it. Uh, I, it has its own issues. For example, you, if, a, if anyone can get any test they want, uh, are we trusting the test? But there are, isn't, I think, clear legal indication either way. Isn't anything that prevents the employer from saying, you have to submit the test and I don't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Might not be very nice. Okay. So uh, we did have a comment in our chat from somebody from UCSF stating that the employer does require masks for uh, people who are un choose to un uh, be unimmunized for flu. Mm -hmm which is a you know, kind of a signal that you are unvaccinated, as well as a, a sticker or identifying tag on their badge or uniform. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that that will be acceptable for employers? I, I guess it's kind of a, a little bit of an oxymoron because you have to be vaccinated or you're terminated. So I guess going forward with healthcare professionals, they will either be vaccinated or they will not be working there. Or but, they will have an exemption. Or they, they may have an exemption. exemption. And do you anticipate it being acceptable for employers to identify those who are unvaccinated, other than the fact that they will have to wear a mask, as probably everyone will going forward? I th so, I, again, it's a question of, are you violating the privacy rules here? Are you disclosing more medical information than you're allowed? And because we have history of having, um, having this done, I think that, yes, you can do that. Great. So Professor Rice, we're getting to the top of our hour. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention to our viewers, first of all, just thank you so much for spending your hour with us. Um, we have gotten to most, but not all of the questions. So um, uh, just to let you know, I did my best to combine questions. I hope you all got answers that work for you, but questions that were unanswered, uh, we will do our best to collate them and reply via email to the attendee list. Um, so thank you so much for your active participation and questions, very much appreciated. And we're so grateful to Professor Rice for her presentation. We'd also like to thank the members of the CIC Education Committee for support in planning and coordinating this call. And a very big thanks to all of you for spending your hour with us, as, as always. Please remember to complete the evaluation form that will automatically pop up after this broadcast to tell you what you, you thought about the webinar. And links to this webinar, as well as past webinars, are available on the CIC website. There were a lot of questions in chat about access to the slides. So just know that if you go to www.immunica.org, you will be able to access the CIC YouTube channel, which will have all our previous and this current webcasts available for you to view. And you can download the slides from that, that location. Um, again. Uh, Dr. Rice or uh, Professor Rice, any final comments? I wish I had time to get to all these questions because these are great questions. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of you can um, have the time to maybe make a list of them, I can try and answer them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I also try to answer individual emails I get, but I don't always uh, have time to uh, give a third and answer as I can to all of them. But I'd be happy to do a handout where I try to answer as many of the questions. I well, I just have to say, I think you did a great job. We had very probing and very timely questions from our audience, and you did a great job with some difficult questions in a moving, in a topic that's constantly moving. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, please check out our website, immunica.org, and um, please stay healthy and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much.